Okay, good morning everyone. Sawadee Kaab. Sawadee Kaab. Welcome everyone. Nice to see you guys. We're going to start with loving kindness meditation just like we've done each morning. And then we're going to move into two different topics today. This first one is the path to enlightenment, practicing the path in the workplace. I'm going to teach you how to bring these teachings into a work environment. Because if you're only practicing these teachings in your personal life, you wouldn't actually be able to experience enlightenment. You're going to need to learn how to bring the teachings of the Buddha into your daily life. And that doesn't mean that you need to go around and tell people that you're practicing the teachings of the Buddha. It just means that you need to learn how to integrate them into your life so that you can practice them on a day-to-day -day basis in all different aspects of your life. And then after that, I'm going to share the art of the friendly no, how to say no without saying no. And we'll probably finish up right before lunch today. So we'll see how things go and how they progress. As you guys know, you're always welcome to ask questions as we go. So if you'd like to join for meditation, you can uh, chant along if you'd like. I'll provide you some guidance on breathing mindfulness meditation. Then we'll go into loving kindness meditation and back to breathing mindfulness meditation before we come out with the chanting. So welcome to you guys here. Welcome to everyone online. Nice to see everybody here this morning. If you'd like to join along, feel free. And then I'll come back after the chanting with some guidance on the meditation. อาระหังสัมมาสัมพุทธะมะเขวาโอตังมะเขวันหังอภิวาเตยมีสวะคะโต <coughs> เวตาตัมโมดามังนามะสามีสุปฏิปันโนมหาเกวตุสาวกสังโฆ Sanghang namami Napmo rasa bhagavato Arato sama samputasa Napmo rasa bhagavato Arato sama samputasa Napmo rasa bhagavato Arato sama samputasa Iti piso mahakawa Arahang sama samuto we cha cha ranang samuno sakato roka vito anu tero purisa nama sati sata tawa manu sanang o to bhagavati okay with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable and the upper body erect just close the eyes and just breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose 
experiencing the full breath. And then whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in <clears throat> and out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, Breathe in naturally through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then when you're ready, exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. With the breath well established, start fixating the mind on the breath, either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and out.
Continuing to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. Repeat these affirmations in the mind on the out breath. May I be peaceful. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May we be peaceful. May we be safe. May we be well. May we be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May my family, friends, and co-workers be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes.
May all those who have caused me harm be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May all those who I have harmed be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May all beings, wherever they reside, be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes.
Now go back to breathing mindfulness meditation, focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. Breathing in. and out.
to slowly make your way out of meditation. So this week we've been meditating each day in the morning and then in the afternoon together as well when we're here in the afternoons. If you're noticing even a second or two of peacefulness during your meditation, this can be confirmation for you that your mind has the ability and the potential to get to enlightenment. That peace and that joy, that calmness that you experience in meditation, this is one of the ways to independently verify that enlightenment is possible because you'll see that the mind can be peaceful and joyful during your meditation. So if you've noticed that at all during your meditations this week, this can help you to independently verify enlightenment. Also, I'd like to make a kind of clarification clarification point with the affirmations that I'm sharing that sometimes when students are learning loving kindness meditation and they hear me say, may all those who harmed me be peaceful. They say, hold on a second, David. I thought you said that, you know, we cause our own discontentedness. How can somebody else harm me? So let me help you with understanding this in case this might be a question in your mind. What harm is, is harm is where you've injured another being, like physically injured them or you've injured their material possessions or something like this. You can injure somebody in terms of harming them, but you can't cause somebody else discontentedness. So somebody else can't cause you discontentedness, but they can harm you. So for example, someone could steal your car and if they stole your car, they're harming you. Right? Because now you can't go to the store to buy supplies to sustain your life. You can't go to work in order to earn money to sustain your life. You can't take your children to school if you have children and things like this. So this person has harmed you. But if you experience anger, or sadness, or frustration, or any other discontent feelings, your mind is causing that itself. So harm is one thing, and discontentedness is another thing. So others can cause you harm, but they can't cause you to be discontent. And same thing with you, is you can cause others harm, but you can't cause them to be discontent. So that's why in the meditation we say, you know, anybody who's harmed me, may they be peaceful, right? So that you don't hold on to resentment for someone who's stolen your car or who's lied to you or who has done any number of different things, right? Uh, maybe somebody uh, cheated on you in a relationship or maybe somebody uh, took away your boyfriend or girlfriend or something like this. Uh, maybe somebody stole your pet or something like this. Or also, you know, when we say, may those who I have harmed 
right? Because there's certain people that we've all harmed in our life. We've done harmful things at different times in our life. And to let that go so that you don't hold on to any kind of guilt or shame or fear related to any harm that you've caused to others, you can transform your mind to develop this loving kindness towards those beings. Because at the time that we were harming somebody, we didn't have loving kindness for those beings. That's why we were harming them because we didn't have loving kindness and or, or well, definitely yes, but uh, potentially in addition or potentially this as well is that there's that ignorance or that unknowing of true reality that was surely there, right? But it may have not been out of ill will. It might've just been with a lack of wisdom, but oftentimes there's ill will in the mind when we're harming another being. So by cultivating loving kindness for any beings that we've harmed, now we can let go of any guilt or resentment, realizing, okay, we lacked wisdom back then, we made unwise decisions back then, but now we're choosing to, to do something different. And we can let go of that situation wherever we've harmed people or whenever people have harmed us, we can let those situations go. And now residing in the present moment, we can have loving kindness and compassion for all beings. So that's the difference between harm and discontent. And this would sometimes people ask questions about okay all right so I'm going to share this topic with you about the path to enlightenment practicing the path in the workplace and then we're going to be discussing the art of the friendly no how to say no without saying no okay so as you're developing the path to enlightenment you're going to need to practice the path in your workplace during your day-to-day work because things like right intention, right speech, right action, but even things like right view and all these other things, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, you can be practicing these at all times during your day. And if you weren't practicing these at all times during your day, then that means if you're going to work and you're practicing wrong speech, that means you're causing harm in your work environment and your career is going to struggle because of that. So I'm going to teach you how to integrate these teachings into your life, even things like practicing singleness of mind and things of this nature. So just like I share with the other discussions we've had, one of the first things that you need is to acquire wisdom. You need to acquire wisdom of the path to enlightenment in order to practice it. So that's the first one. And then being dedicated to meditation and practicing generosity. So having breathing mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation, doing this before work can be really, really helpful so that when you show up to your work environment, your mind can be peaceful and joyful. You can have loving kindness for the people around you in your work environment, your coworkers. And practicing generosity is really helpful in the work environment too, whether it's bringing in some food or some other things, but just be sure as you're doing that, that you're providing enough for everybody. If you work in a small company, this can be kind of easy if there's three, four, five, six employees, it's pretty easy. But if you work in a big corporation where there's, you know, hundreds or thousands of people, you're going to need to be uh, aware of how to practice generosity in these kinds of environments. Like say it was your birthday and you would like to bring in a cake in order to share with your coworkers. Well, one of the ways to do that is, you know, you can't physically take around a piece of cake to 300 people. You know, this would take you probably your entire day to do this. So probably what you might do is maybe go into a conference room, you know, at lunchtime, uh, cut up all these pieces of cakes, put them out and just let everybody know, hey, if you would like to come have a piece of cake, you know, this is something you can come to the conference room and then it's their choice of whether they come or not. And if they choose not to come, they're choosing not to come. Whereas if you went around and you only handed out cake to 20 people and the other, you know, 200 and Uh, 80 people didn't get a piece of cake, they'll feel jealous because of their craving. And now that painful feeling, they're going to attribute it to you. And now you're making difficulty uh, in your relationships because those people are going to push you aside and they're going to have resentment and bitterness and hostility towards you for this. So you can go into a situation where you just bring something into a conference room and you invite people to come. And if they choose to come or they don't choose to come, it's their choice of whether they're coming or not. And then if they uh, are having any kind of craving, then, you know, that's, that's on them, but you've made the offer to everybody to come, right? And then this will help preserve your relationships with your coworkers. So practicing meditation and generosity, even, uh, 
before uh, work, but even during work too. There were times where when I was in the work environment where I needed to meditate, I would go find a quiet place at work to meditate. And oftentimes where I found myself was in the stall of a bathroom. I would just leave my my pants on. I didn't have to use the bathroom. I would sit on the toilet and I would sit there and and meditate because that was the one place that I could find. But nowadays, some businesses are having like little meditation rooms. I worked at some companies that were like this, that they would have like these little meditation rooms that you could go to during your day. So this is an option as well. There was one company that I worked at that as, as a manager, I was able to uh, you know, manage my own schedule. And each Wednesday at a certain time, I would have it blocked off on my schedule so that I wouldn't have any meetings and people couldn't schedule meetings with me during that time. And that was time for me to go do my own thing and do things like I used to get a chiropractic adjustment. I used to go off to the park sometimes and meditate and things like this. So you can schedule these kinds of things into your work week or into your work day. And then don't feel guilty about doing that because this is helping you to be a better employee if you need to do some meditation either at your morning or lunch break or after work or sometime during the day. Oftentimes employers are understanding of those kinds of things. Um, You'll need to eliminate complacency as it relates to the path to enlightenment, of course. In order to get to enlightenment, you're going to need to be dedicated, determined, and diligent, but also related to your work. Right. So when the Buddha is teaching you certain teachings about the path to enlightenment, about having the enlightenment factor of energy where you have ambition and motivation and enthusiasm that you show initiative, uh, this is all related to his teachings. But you can take that type of teaching and you can apply it to other aspects of your life like work so that you're not complacent in your work projects, that you can apply dedication, determination and diligence to your work projects, too. If you agree to somebody that you're going to have something done by Friday. Friday and you can apply dedication and diligence to have it done by Friday. But if for some reason you can't have it done by Friday, following up and talking with that person, helping them understand why this is really helpful for you, right? So ensuring that you're practicing uh, the elimination of complacency as it relates to your work projects and practicing the teachings as well. Practicing right livelihood, which I talked about on Monday, this is really important to ensure that you're not causing harm to any other beings to sustain your life. So that's where we talked about business and weapons, living beings, meat, substances that cause heedlessness and poisons. Uh, And then as you're developing your mind more and more with the right livelihood, there's a whole another teaching that the Buddha shares related to right livelihood. If you look in volume 12, chapter 14, he talks about eliminating the fetters or the taints or the pollutions as you're making your choice and livelihood. And I have details there in volume 12, chapter 14 to be able to help you learn how to do this. By the time you get to a right livelihood, it won't even feel like work anymore. You'll just thoroughly enjoy what you're doing on a day-to-day basis, that you'll just thoroughly enjoy the work that you're doing. Uh, You'll be motivated and encouraged. It doesn't even feel like work. Like you you would probably do this for free if you could, but of course you need to collect money in order to sustain your life, but you enjoy it so much that even if you weren't getting paid, you would still enjoy doing this type of work. So that's where you'll be able to get to a fully purified livelihood. There's other teachings that the Buddha shares here, not only about weapons, living beings, meat, substances that cause heedlessness and poisons, but he also shares these teachings about scheming, flattering, hinting, belittling, pursuing gain with gain. And we talked about this on Monday as well. So you would like to be practicing that because that's going to ensure that you have a really good solid livelihood, that you're not having corruption in your livelihood or that you're not Uh, giving insincere comments or flattery just to get people to buy things from you, that you're clear and concise in your communication, you're not just hinting around, that you're not belittling your coworkers or your business partners or your competition, degrading and diminishing them, and that you're also not just pursuing gain with gain, meaning just collecting a paycheck and that's all you care about, that you aren't really interested in the product or service, you're just there for the money and that's it, because you're not going to feel very motivated for very long if you're showing up to a job just for the money. Eventually that craving will get extinguished and you'll feel very miserable in that particular job because there's nothing really meaningful for you there. There's not a service or a product that you really care about and that you're really interested in. So by the time you purify your livelihood to this first level, you'll be experiencing quite a bit of joy at work in day-to-day life. But then you would like to be sure you select a livelihood where you don't have any of the fetters involved. 
then remember that your mind can only do one thing at a time, that when you're in a work environment, people oftentimes tug and pull and try to grab you in different directions. And you're going to need to practice singleness of mind in order to bring your mind into the present moment. So let's just say you're at your desk typing out an email. And as you're typing out this email, somebody barges into your office. Hey, I have an emergency. I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. Right? Well, instead of keep writing the email and trying to talk to that person at the same time, it would be best to stop doing the email and now address that person and talk to that person if that's what you need to do. Right? Just do one thing at a time. Or say you're on the phone and now somebody barges into your office. Maybe what you do is you just stay on the phone and you just keep talking on the phone and you let that person know like, one moment, right? But you're focused on the conversation. Whereas if you break away from your conversation, what you're teaching your coworkers is that when you're on the phone, they can barge into your office and you're going to interrupt your phone call and address them. And what you're going to find is you're going to have a lot of people barging into your office because you're teaching your coworkers that anytime they barge into your office, you're going to address them. So you can kind of through your own actions, through the way you operate, is the people around you will learn that it's not possible to come barging into your office and you're going to redirect your focus to them. An emergency on their part doesn't mean an emergency on your part, right? This is something that people usually talk about in business environment because sometimes people think that what they have is so urgent and such an emergency, they will barge in, right? I've been on uh, Zoom conferences with students before. And in the past, my son would barge into my room and he would say, dad, you know, I have an emergency, I have an emergency. And I would say, hold on. And I would just continue to talk, teaching him like, Hey, you can't just barge into dad's room and I'm going to address you. So I would keep talking to the student. And then after I'm done, I would then talk to my son and I would say, what's going on? He said, my batteries in my remote control car aren't working. I need uh, some new batteries. And I was like, this isn't an emergency, right? So an emergency on someone else's part isn't necessarily an emergency on your part. So I use that opportunity to teach him. Hey, if the house is burning down, if the house is falling down, okay, these are emergencies, right? If there's flooding somewhere and there's water rising up, these, these things are an emergency. So you're going to need to operate in such a way that you're making decisions that people don't just barge in. So over time, my son learned that he doesn't just barge into my room, that he, uh, if he comes in, he quietly comes in, he will stand there patiently. He will wait until I get to a breaking point and then I'll be able to address whatever it is that he needs to be addressed. But oftentimes the things that he has to share aren't an actual emergency. So he doesn't even come into my room anymore. But initially for about 20 different times, he would come in and then I would just keep talking and keep talking, and keep talking to the student. And then he would be standing there and eventually he would realize that what he had to talk about wasn't so important and he would just leave on his own. Right. And he would kind of learn this and he learned on his own that it's unwise to barge into somebody's room and just start trying to talk to them and get their attention. So how you choose to operate and what decisions you make in your work environment, you're teaching people around you at all times how to interact with you. And if what you teach them is that when you're on the phone, you're going to break away from your conversation and talk to them every single time, then you're going to keep having a lot of people barge into your office. So you're going to need to do things single threadedly one at a time doing one thing at a time. And this is what's going to help you to develop the mind to eliminate this idea of multitasking and develop concentration and focus. Practicing singleness of mind so that you can do one thing at a time. By addressing just one person at a time, as people come to see you, just one person at a time. What you're ultimately working to is where you can maintain your mind as calmness, having mindfulness, concentration, and access wisdom. If you're making any unwise decisions at any point during your day, it's going to produce unwholesome results. This is unwholesome gamma. So in order to get to enlightenment, you need to make constant wise decisions. And this is where you gradually bring up your wisdom and gradually making wiser and wiser decisions and gradually bringing down your unwise decisions. So by keeping your mind calm and collected, you'll have mindfulness or awareness of mind. You'll have concentration. You'll then be able to access your wisdom and make wise decisions. Whereas if you allow your mind to be uh, uncalm and unsettled and work in a work 
work environment, you won't have mindfulness, you won't have concentration, and you won't be able to access your wisdom. So you like to maintain your calmness and composure at all times. If you need to step away from a meeting or you need to step away from a phone call or something like this, you can do these kinds of things in order to regain your composure. Go outside, go for a walk, things like this. This will help you to then go into a meeting or go into a conversation that you need to have where you can have calmness and composure to have mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom and make wise decisions in the work environment because it's those wise decisions that are going to lead to wholesome outcomes in your life. This eightfold path, the entire eightfold path can be practiced at work, whether it's right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, or right concentration. Every single one of those things can be practiced at work and you'll need to practice them at work in order to um, get to enlightenment. So what I've done here is I've taken the Eightfold Path, just a couple of the steps, or actually all the steps here, and now I'm showing you how to apply these in work, right? Because you're learning about right view, about accepting responsibility for your own feelings through it's craving desire attachment that's causing these feelings but you can apply this to a work environment too that with right view you can accept and acknowledge responsibility for the projects and assignments that you have everything that you experience at work is a result of your decisions so rather than kind of brush off your responsibilities to somebody else on a project team or something like that you can look at how applying right view of accepting responsibility for your own feelings and emotions and your actions and the things that you do in day-to-day -day life you can apply this to work too that you accept responsibility for your work projects and then the right intention right speech right action right livelihood it's essential to practice these at all times during your your livelihood that you practice renunciation being willing to let go you practice non-ill will and harmlessness that you practice all those factors of right speech right action and right livelihood as part of your day-to-day -day life this is so important no matter what it is even when you're talking to a customer service agent about something on the phone being polite kind friendly and respectful this is going to help you because more and more you bring your practice up to that level where now you can practice this with everybody even this person you'll never meet they might be in a far distant land in some call center and you'll never actually meet them but if you can practice right speech with that individual as maybe your computer's broken or there's something wrong with a phone bill or something like this and you're calling somebody up in order to get customer support you would like to even in those situations be practicing right intention right speech and right action as you're interacting with people in all situations and when you're at work doing those things as well and then also practicing right effort right mindfulness and right call right concentration cultivating the mind and practicing this mental discipline where mindfulness is awareness of mind that when you're in a business meeting you're aware of your mind if you're noticing that it's moving off the topic and you're noticing that your mind's not in the present moment you cut that off applying right effort bringing the mind into the present moment if you're noticing that you're in a business meeting and you're judging other people and looking down on them for any reason apply right effort and cut that off if you're having dislike or annoyment or you're frustrated at your boss for any particular reason you can see that with your mindfulness apply right effort to cut that off and eliminate it and you can apply concentration wherever your mind is needing to be in a particular meeting or conversation wherever you see it wandering you can cut that off and bring it back so this is how you can apply this in day-to-day -day life in your work environment so let me know if you guys have questions here either at the temple or those of you guys online those of you online, you can put your questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. Because keep in mind that I teach to a certain level of detail, and then as you guys ask questions, we can go deeper into the detail. Okay? Any questions? No questions? Okay, let's see here. Do you have any questions online? Okay, I don't see any questions online anywhere. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to move right into this next topic of the art of the friendly no, how to say no without saying no. Sometimes you might need to say no, but oftentimes for people who aren't on the path, people who uh, are struggling with certain pollutions in their mind and a lack of wisdom, when you say no to people, it can be really impactful to them, whether it's in a work environment or whether it's in a personal environment. If somebody invites you to a party, for example, maybe in a work environment, people are inviting you over for like a, 
a wedding or a housewarming or a birthday party or just a regular party. And by you saying no, if they have a craving for you to come, when you say no, this can arise painful feelings in their mind. It's not your saying no that's causing that. It's their craving, desire, attachment that's causing their painful feelings. But you would like to practice in a way that provides the least opportunity for individuals to become angry, to become frustrated, so that if you can modify the way that you interact in the world a bit, then this will help other beings to not have their craving, desire, attachment triggered. And this can be really helpful for you in your relationships because where people are off the path to enlightenment, where they're non-practitioners and they're experiencing painful feelings, they're going to attribute it to you and they're going to push you aside. At the very least, they'll typically push you aside and you'll end up experiencing broken relationships or they might become bitter, harsh and hostile and aggressive with you, right? Like say your boss invited you to a particular party and you didn't go, right? This could be problematic for you in the work environment or if you said, no, I can't come. So what I'm going to teach you here is how to say no. It's kind of like a friendly no. So the problem is, is that the unrelated mind does not typically like hearing the word no and also other variations of that, like can't, don't, won't. The mind doesn't like to hear this and because of its cravings, it will experience painful feelings. So the solution is it's best not to use these words whenever possible, but instead find alternate ways to communicate. So for example, I'll just give you some examples and then you guys can ask me questions about these if you like. These aren't like exact things that you guys have to do, but this is a way for you to think about kind of changing your perspective of the way you interact with people. That if somebody says, uh, David, can you come to my party this weekend? I really like you to come. I might say, oh, thank you so much for the invite. I really appreciate your kindness. If I can come, I will let you know, right? I'll just leave it at that rather than say, no, I can't come. And right? I'll say, if I'm able to come, I will let you know. This is a way to say no without saying no, right? Um, or, uh, you know what? Uh, I haven't looked at my schedule recently. I'll need to look at my schedule. And if I'm able to come, I'll definitely let you know. You can say things like this. So there might be any number of things that you might experience somebody inviting you to or asking you about. And what you'll notice is if you use the word no, don't, can't, won't, these kinds of things, that people will tend to react in a negative way, in an unwholesome way. But if you can modify the way that you speak and you can use this kind of terminology or this kind of phrasing, this will really help you in your relationships where you're not giving them that hard stop or that hard no. But instead, you can kind of share these kinds of things. So if you guys would like to um, ask me any questions about like invitations to a party or an event or borrowing money or things like this, I can help you. We can go through a couple scenarios if you like. There was a situation I had one time where a really good college friend of mine came to visit me and asked me to borrow money and I didn't handle it very well at all. And next thing I know, I never heard from that person again, right? This was a really good friend that I asked him, I said, well, what did you do last night? Cause he came to visit me on a Sunday. Um, he was still in college and I wasn't, I had graduated the year before. And I said, what did you do last night? He's like, oh, we went out partying, you know, we had all these drinks, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, if you're so hard up for money, then why is it that you went out drinking? I was like, why wouldn't you have saved that money for, for that? I was like, if you don't pay your tuition, you're going to go back home and live with mom and dad. But if I don't pay my bills, I don't have anywhere to go. I don't have anywhere to live. So I don't have the money to, to let you borrow this and have for you to go out drinking. Well, of course, you know, he didn't like that answer. So, you know, I never saw him again. Where what I could have said is said something different. You know, I could have said uh, in a adjusted, maybe I could have said, well, you know what? I need to look at my funds and see what's available. If I have a money that's extra that I can let you borrow, I will contact you and let you know. I probably could have said something like that, but I didn't have the wisdom at that time. So the relationship was ended because he experienced painful feelings because one of his really good friends didn't let him borrow money. He had a certain craving for the money. He associated those painful feelings with me and he pushed me aside thinking that that's going to solve the problem, right? So you can actually preserve your relationships by not using the word no or going into this exhaustive discussion of why you can't do something like, which is what I did, right? You can do other 
other things. And you can see how this really works in a work environment or in your personal environment as you start using it. Initially, when you first start using this kind of things, it can be a bit challenging. It can feel a little bit awkward and strange because you're not used to it. But the more that you do these kinds of things, you'll get very used to it and it'll just become very normal for you. So this is what I have to share with you today. If you guys have questions online or you guys have questions here, let me know. We can talk about this. If you guys have thoughts that you'd like to share or if you have certain questions or if you like have certain scenarios that you would like to discuss, we can discuss any of those kinds of things. You guys have anything here? Anything online? Okay, looks like Keely, you have a question. Go ahead, ma'am. David, so I met this kind of situation a couple of days ago. Um, my colleague who is a driver and um, uh, my boss asked me to arrange um, the car for the kids uh, tomorrow, that's Saturday, because the parents are going to travel um, abroad. So I tell the driver that uh, he needs to pick up the kids in the morning. Um, the driver told me he's um, not able to do that because he has other uh, assignments. And so I said, okay, uh, then I should report to the mom. And the driver said, no, you don't need to report the mom. He plans to ask another driver who can uh, who to pick up two kids at the same time, but that that um, since the two kids um, they have different classes at the same time, and one driver cannot pick up two kids at the same time. So I said no, that's impossible, and I should let the mom to decide uh, how to arrange the cars and the kids at the same time. Then the driver keep saying, no, you should then report to mom. We can handle it by ourselves. So I, but for my perspective is, no, you are not the kid's parents. You cannot decide by yourself. You should let the parents know how to uh, handle this kind of situation. You should know what the parents arrangement. So um, the driver think uh, it is me who push him to do things, but from my perspective is, uh, since mom asked me to uh, tell them to do, to pick up the kids and it's, they cannot do that. And I think it's my responsibility to report to the parents. So uh, in the end, the driver did report to mom and uh, mom said, uh, the si sister can take a tap while the little brother will have uh, the other driver to pick him up. So in the end, the situation uh, solved, but the driver keep calling me to teach me how to do things in his way, not in my way. So um, I want to know in this kind of situation, how, can, how should I say no without saying no? Mm -hmm. So what I would have done in that situation is if the driver is like, I don't need to talk to the parents, I don't need to discuss anything with the parents, blah, 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 blah. I would say, okay, that's your choice and that's the decision that you're making, but I'm going to talk with the parents and be sure the parents are informed. This is what I prefer to do. And then if the driver's like, no, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I understand your perspective. Thank you for sharing that with me. And then I would just be quiet and go do what you know you need to do, right? You don't need to get the driver to agree with your decision in order for you to implement your decision. You can just go implement your decision. Um, because you know what is important. And then if they're trying to pressure you otherwise, just walk away because you don't need to adopt other people's expectations. He's made his decision or she's made her decision about what she's choosing to do. And then you make your decision what you think is wise and what's important. But you don't need to 
either adopt their expectation, but also you don't need to put your expectation on them. Whatever choice they've made, if they're choosing not to inform the parents, then they're going to experience the results of that, that the potentially the parents are going to feel less trusting of their driver and potentially he may lose his job at some point or she may lose her job at some point. But for you, if you know it's wise to inform the parents, the parents are going to really appreciate that and then you're going to experience the results of that. So you just make the decision that you know is wise for you and then just step away and that person is making the decision that they feel is wise for them. And then that way you're not putting your expectations on them and you're not adopting their expectations as something that you should do. Yeah, that's what, what I do. And I also want to know, in this kind of situation, do I need to um, like do the loving kind meditation and hope uh, goodwill for this uh, call it? Like, uh, should I do the meditation and uh, saying, may he be uh, peaceful, uh, be well, this kind of meditation for him particularly? It's always wise to include in your loving kindness meditation at different times, the various people that are around you. So this is why I usually include mom, dad, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, children, friends, uh, coworkers, neighbors, things like this. Like these are all wise things to do regularly. But whenever there's a situation that you've experienced where you have frustration or agitation or annoyance or any of those dislike feelings towards another being, no matter who they are, coworker or others, you should include them in your meditation for a period of time. I would say minimum of three to five days minimum. And then you need to observe the mind and look at the mind and see, is there any frustration? Is there any annoyment? Is there any dislike there? And you'd really like to stamp this out and kind of wring it out. The Buddha describes it as cutting it off at the palm tree, making it like a palm stump, obliterating and destroying these fetters. So wherever you see that the mind is having any of these discontent feelings, and if it's being directed towards this person, then yes, definitely include them in your meditation. But then at the same time, it's wise to include coworkers in your meditation regularly. You know, if, if you did everybody you knew in a particular meditation, you'd be meditating for quite a long time. So that's where like you can have kind of like a general structure of your meditation where you have a couple of people that you currently have loving kindness for, a couple of people you're more neutral about, and then a couple of people that you do have anger and hatred towards and then do that for a week or two or three. And then as you notice that the mind has eliminated its discontent feelings or anger or sadness or frustration or agitation towards these people, then you can move those people out and then move in new people that you need to move in in order to now transform the mind related to those relationships and kind of keeping your meditation fluid. So you'll have to look at your mind and see what kind of feelings you have towards this person. And if you're noticing any of those discontent feelings, then yes, include them in your meditation for a period of time. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, David. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. I'm not seeing any other questions anywhere on any of our platforms. So this is essentially bringing to an end our um, course here this week. So what I'm going to do here is just share with you guys that Whenever you're learning in a particular course or a retreat or something like this, there's usually a lot of information in any one particular course. And it's impossible for you to learn everything that's being shared in one particular learning event. And then it's not only is it impossible for you to learn everything in one particular learning event, it's impossible for you to integrate those teachings into your life 100% after just learning them for five days. I've seen research on this where they say when you go through a particular learning event, the first time you learn about 10% and retain about 10% of what is actually being offered in that learning event. And then they say when you repeat that, that you learn about 30 or 40% of what's being really offered. And then maybe like a third time, it's like 60, 80, 100% of what you're actually learning in that particular learning event. So as you've learned this week, whether it's here at the temple or whether it's online, I'm sure you haven't learned every single thing that is being shared and offered in this particular course. And 
you've probably absorbed a lot and you might feel a little bit overwhelmed to a certain degree. If you've noticed that, then it's kind of like when you eat a big meal. If you eat a big meal, you're going to step away from the table and you're going to digest the, that food. And then maybe at a certain point, you might come back a few hours later and you might eat again, right? If you're having a big family feast or something like that, you might need to eat a certain amount, step away, digest for a few hours, talk with some people, come back, have some more food. It's the same kind of thing as when you go through one of these learning events, you might decide that you have learned a particular amount of information during a particular period of time, and you might need to step away and kind of think about what it is that you've learned, integrate it into your life, get some clarification through some personal guidance or reading some of the books that I share and things like this. And then maybe at some point you decide, okay, I would like to learn some more and I'd like to learn some more. So keep that in mind that if you do feel a little bit overwhelmed with what's been shared or you feel like you haven't learned everything that's being shared, this is very normal. This is understandable. And this is why the Buddha taught in the way that he did, which was with repetition. When he would teach, he would repetitively say the same things over and over and over again, because students needed to hear things over and over and over again in order to understand them. This is why if you read the books that I write, uh, I have repetition built into the books because you need to hear the same thing over and over and over again, oftentimes before it really soaks into the mind. So if you guys would like to take any of these classes or courses or retreats over again, you're more than welcome. As you know, I teach them throughout the year. You're welcome to attend them at any time. They're also recorded so you can watch them on the recordings and things like this. You're always welcome to reach out to me to get help. There's four different ways that you can get help. You can post a message or post, make a post on our Facebook group. And if you make a post on our Facebook group, I'll see that and I'll be the one who replies to that and answers it. You can ask questions in classes like this, and I will answer your questions in any of the classes, either online or in person. You can send me a private message and I will be able to answer you the private message, or you can schedule personal guidance. These are all options for you to be able to learn and continue to grow. There's continued support on the path to enlightenment. You can continue to learn, you can continue to grow, you can continue to understand the teachings through books, audiobooks, videos, podcasts, quizzes. There's in-person and online classes, courses, and retreats. These are all accessible through our website. Then we have these two ongoing programs. The group learning program is a nice foundational program. Each Sunday and Wednesday, you can be learning. And if you can't attend live, you can attend through the replay because it's all recorded. And then after students develop a nice foundation, they will typically move into the Pali Canon and English study group where we study the original words of the Buddha each Saturday. And then as I mentioned, you can schedule personal guidance from our website. If you're Scheduling for like a Zoom session, you go to our website and there's a, a, a little app that you can schedule. It'll show you the available times and then we'll meet in Zoom. But if you'd like to meet in person, like here in, in Thailand or as I travel around the world, you can just send me a private message and we can meet in person. We can schedule a time and, or you can talk to me in person and, and we'll schedule a time to meet, meet and get together. And then you have this Facebook group to be able to help you as well, because sometimes students are not only posting questions in there and getting answers, but other students oftentimes like to read other students' questions and read their answers, and they learn that way too. So these are all options that are available to you openly and freely to continue your support and continue to experience progress on the path to enlightenment. So I'd like to thank all of you guys for joining, whether it's here at the temple or those of you guys online. Thank you for being dedicated to learn the teachings. Thank you for any support that you've provided me during the week, whether it's donations or food or uh, any kind of thing that you've done to be able to help me share these teachings throughout the week. I'd like to share my appreciation for all of that and all your support. If there's anything that you would like for help from me, just let me know and I'm here to help you. Okay, so have a very wonderful and lovely rest of your day and your week and your weekend. And then whenever you would like to learn some more, I'll be here sharing the teachings. So take care and perhaps we'll see you guys in one of these future classes. Okay, sawadikhap, sawadikhap.
Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you.